day to you. This is Anna Galactic, bringing you another science presentation in a synthetic sequence in quantum mechanics to get the solution if possible. No one's sure if there's a solution to the quantum paradox. Today is March 4th, a Monday, here in Chico, California in 2024. We've had several lead-up lectures. We've had several lead-up series. This is the most difficult problem that's ever been faced in science, certainly in physics. And it's the somehow part of the key to the secrets of the universe, which is my byline. What we've accomplished as of yesterday in the transmission of a new vision of the problem itself, trying to get a change of set, which is an internal reconfiguration of the facts, we determined a very important and substantial fact. Although it has to be stated in the paradoxical form. That's what we're limited to right now. That's the infuriating and frustrating aspect of a paradox. It's virtually impossible to even talk about it. Because if you could talk about it rationally, it wouldn't be a paradox. So we're going to state a new insight. This has been perceived, but never explored. So this is a major possibility for an inroad to the paradox to get the solution. So let me state what that is. What we learned is that one way to formulate the paradox itself, so that you're stating what it is, the way you do this is critical toward the solution orientation, is how you formulate the paradox. We have several schools, philosophies, theoretical models, they can be called tentative models in the hypothetic sense, that none of them succeed, but each of them follows the same pattern in getting at the solution. And then there's a divergence. We've narrowed that down to a binary divergence, which I can just summarize quite simply as there is almost certainly a violation of relativity. Now that is really saying a lot because relativity, that is, and I, I'm just going to assume here that you know what I mean by relativity. It's easy to state, but we're not going to dawdle here. We have to maintain continuity at this phase of the synthetic solution. But there are two ways to violate relativity. <laughs> One of them would be to travel faster than light. I have stated, and I will continue to state until someone can state this any better than I state it, although nobody right now disagrees with this statement, nothing can travel faster than light. That will never be violated because it's a tautology. Now, even having said that, I must say, because it, the paradox hasn't been solved, and while the paradox is not solved, you have to be very cautious how you state what you think are facts because that could be the source of the misperception. Is it perhaps things can travel faster than light? Well, that, of course, has been suggested, but it has not led anywhere. But that doesn't mean that it's not the right solution path. It just means that it's been rejected as being obviously wrong. Well, you could say that about every model, theory, school, position, philosophy of the, the um, paradox. So to, re to complete my sentence, there is another violation possible. Not, it's not merely saying, relativity is not merely asserting that nothing can travel faster than light. It's also asserting that there's always a time lag between positions, that you cannot have a spatial separation without there being a coordinated, actually a linear, linearly related difference in time. And we know that, that's really the whole meaning of a light year. Why would a year be in a distance measurement? 
because that refers to the time component and that's interpreted as space-time distance which is hyperbolic because one of them at least has to be curved to get at gravity. So I hope you have a reasonable grip on that aspect of the relationship between quantum mechanics and relativity. There's a direct relationship between them. It's practically the paradox itself because what's being violated that causes the paradox is indeed Einsteinian relativity, but that can be perceived in one of two ways. One would be that something can be shown to travel faster than light. That will never be shown because that actually is impossible. I am stating that as the axiomatic basis of the approach to the paradox. That that's where you begin is indeed with what we already know and nobody denies that this is true. This is one of the most absolutely proved facts in the history of physics is light speed is absolute. You cannot have any anything traveling faster than light in the universe. So we're going to assert that that is a true statement. And now for the other possible violation of special relativity, there's another one. And that's the one we actually see, which is you can have two positions, which would then be particles, because you can only measure a position if it's a particle. So we do say that light manifests as a photon for that reason, because you wouldn't be able to measure light if it weren't at some point a particle, which is a nice pun. And, the, and we determined in the last lecture that you can substantiate that statement by realizing another well-known fact, which is that light has an enormous amount of information packed into it, which means that the photon contains that information. Certainly, in some sense, uh, either distributed or not. In other words, the photon contains information, but it may be sharing it with other photons. That would be practically the definition of a wave <laughs> where the information that the photon contains is not in photonic, it's not in particle form. But when we receive light with our instruments or w directly with our eyes, the particle nature of light is instantly reconstituted. It comes back from its waveform in an unknown process called the collapse of the wave function. Well, the reason why that is an unknown function is that it implies that the photon had not been in one place while it was traveling. And that's the definition of it traveling as a wave. It's not in one place. That's what a wave is. It's something that's not positional. Its position is stretched which means it's not a position if it's stretched. <laughs> so it's in that condition in space. But when it arrives, it transitions to its other state. We have to put it that way. But in order for it to transition from its wave state to its particle state, it executes a non-spatial adjustment. Because you can't collapse a wave to a point without, without there being a time lag. And we find now that there is no time lag. So the collapse of the wave function implies instantaneity, which you have to expand to get the full meaning of the paradox. It's instantaneity without any distance being involved. In other words, you're leaving behind distance in order to recompose yourself as a non a non-distributed thing you're turning from a wave into a particle and that simply must take some time but it doesn't it happens instantaneously now the way we got at that so we can actually perceive it somewhat with our perceptual space 
This has actually been done. You take two coordinated particles, which are called entangled, but it means coordinated in a known way, and you separate them in order to create a, a, a space-time lag. It's a space-time separation. Well, there's two components to that separation. One is space and one is time. We consider those to be inextricably correlated, that as you separate in space, you're separating in time. If you get as far as the moon, there is about a three-second time span. We consider that to be a linear, because it's associated with a linear distance, there's a linear time lag, which we can measure quite accurately. And if you're sending a, a light You're sending light to Saturn for communication purposes to control your craft. There's about a two hour time lag. So there is a time separation. Well, an entanglement, as it's called, which are these two coordinated particles, you separate them by space. You've heard of this, it's quite famous now. You separate, well, why are you separating those two particles that are coordinated? It's to see if they indeed exhibit non-spatial simultaneity which is redundant that instead of coordinating two positions you're now trying to coordinate two events to see if they actually are occurring without a time lag and that is what has been shown so that is a major inroad of insight which has gone Nothing has gone disregarded, but that path also has seemingly led nowhere because all paths lead nowhere so far. We're looking for the right path. Well, once you realize that and adopt it as your path, you can then make hypothetical steps to see if that can possibly be resolved with a change of set. You rearrange the facts somehow which also entails examining your presuppositions, which you consider to be facts. One of them is being violated. You have to select which one is being violated. And we know that nothing travels faster than light. But can there be transluminal synchronicity? Can indeed two particles be in such a state of coordination that they behave as one particle. When you put it that way, you've made a tremendous insight into the paradox. If it turns out to be the right way to formulate it, in order to adjust our perceptual space to match the universe, that's what we're looking for. And we found that we cannot adjust the situation objectively to achieve the answer, no matter what we do, we hit the same paradox, and therefore there's only one possible location left. If the train of reasoning that I just gave you is correct, that means there's something wrong in our presuppositions. There's something wrong in our axiomatic basis for approach to the phenomenon at all, which is a fancy way of saying we're not seeing what's happening correctly. Well, that's a geometric scenario. As a, if we're not seeing it correctly, it means we don't have a perceptual ge space. We don't have a geometry in which to see what's happening. Well, then that's going to be new if this is the correct approach. It is, and I'm going to show you now that it is to wrap up yesterday's broadcast. Because we made progress, but... In science, you need to recapitulate and reconsolidate what you already discovered leading up to your present cutting edge. And we're at the cutting edge now, attempting to cross the finish line. So the phenomenon that we're now looking at, that we're calling the essence of the quantum paradox, is that you have two positional objects, which have to be called particles because they have position. And you assume that you know what these things are because you're looking at them in your laboratory. This has been done. And you take two particles, either electrons, or this can also be done with photons, but it's typically electrons. Very interesting particles because they manifest the quantum paradox by their very existence. 
as, as indeed so does the photon. But the electron is easier to control for obvious reasons. A photon attempts to get away. <laughs> and the electron doesn't because it has spatial locality. That's what the photon lacks. It, the, the photon does not have spatial locality. It's traveling. <laughs> so, again, part of the paradox, right? So, we have two particles, which we do know what those are because they do have locality. But now something bizarre happens. And this was the nature of these experiments that were done over the past decades to get at this, to be sure that that's what we're seeing, that we're seeing a violation of relativity. Is that when you coordinate the two particles, then you separate them in space-time. That's what's assumed is happening. Right? You're separating them in space. That's the spatial separation. But according to relativity, there, there's a time separation. And we associate that with the distance separation because they are coordinated. There's a linear relationship between time separation and space separation. There's a footnote to that, but that's an accurate statement. So now you have these two coordinated particles and you've separated them in space and you've separated them in time because you just said the same thing. That's the nature of space-time. That's, that's the nature of relativity, is that time and space are linearly coordinated. And that's been proved. But now, since you have a time lag, there's a time separation, and this is a separation between events, not positions. That's a very interesting insight as well, so let me repeat that. You, in space-time, you have the typical human percep perceptible spatial separation. <laughs> spatial separation conceived linearly. And that spatial separation separates two positions, which can be measured on a straight line. Correct? Obviously. But then you turn to the other side. There's a time separation which we conceive to be overlaid with the spatial separation because they're both linear concepts in the construct. That time is then linear. It's a linear separation. So there is also a possibility of violating event separation. That's exactly what happens. And since it's associated with a positional separation, that's considered to be a violation of relativity because even though there's the space separation, there is not the associated time separation, making time a most queer domain, which I've penetrated, but it's interesting how to get at this. It will be shocking, but then you're going to see that it makes sense. And Einstein has already given us the clue that we need. When you have these two particles that are coordinated, they do not think that they're different particles. They believe that they're the same particle. And nothing can change that. And so when one changes, the other one will change. Well, that's a fact. So, the right way to state the paradox is that the physical phenomenon of, of, of space independence in event coordination, these are coordinated, we think of them as positions, but we can only tell if they're coordinated such that they're defying the time lag that they're simultaneous, we're trying to prove the simultaneity of event state. Because if we can prove the simultaneity of event state, then relativity is wrong. That is indeed a serious paradox because that challenges the basis of modern science as it's perceived 
it may not be actually the correct or you could say and better said that Einsteinian relativity considered to be the bedrock of science this is the axiomatic basis but it is based on this model of time space usually called space time but you see you could actually say it the other way around and that's worth a Ganonkin experiment just to test in your mind what would be the difference if any between time space and space time hold that thought now you have the two separated positions where the events are not separated so while these two positions are anywhere they're still coordinated in time and that can be proved by experimentation I'll, I want to leave that open it's been strongly suggested there is positive evidence it's very difficult to set up this experiment because of the speed of light you're trying to measure it simultaneity but you're reliant on your time framework to do so so this has led to all kinds of interesting theorizations on the role of the observer has, has been a major topic in quantum mechanics because it seems to be the only way out is that the observer must be affecting the outcome by again by spooky action at a distance somehow well that whole phenomenon is called quantum entanglement and I've led you to see that is the correct approach first of all by restating the phenomenon correctly uh, mathematical physics is well known for the goofiest stupidest most anti-scientific naming conventions not even convention just random names in this case not quite random but entanglement is a is the wrong word it's not entangled the reason for saying that is because the the term entanglement is referring to a logic system where the logic is entangled because of the interim logical mode which is not wanted in binary logic you don't want something between true and false it's like what there's nothing so we have two event separation we have an event separation that cannot that cannot be demonstrated to exist which violates relativity because relativity is based on the premise that spatial separation directly implies temporal separation separation of events that because of the space separation between the two particles a change in one cannot be instantaneously coordinated with the change in the other but it is so that is a violation and that's the correct statement to make this is our axiomatic approach we're developing our hypothetical framework for assaulting the problem to get at it to figure out what we did wrong because we did something wrong somewhere along the line we did something wrong and now we know what we did wrong if you adopt my approach you're going to see the answer so follow with me if you dare and I'll warn you when it gets to the mind split part although it's there throughout <laughs> we're looking right at the answer okay that's what's amazing so our premise here strategically is to state the problem as clearly and lucidly as we can on the supposition according to the polya method that that is always the correct step in approaching a paradox that you want to be absolutely sure that you understand your question because by doing so you are going to force yourself closer to the answer that's a form of magic okay a form of wizardry where scientists get their spookiness from they're like wizards they can solve anything well that's what we want to do <laughs> so here's how to do it we now have two events these are event 
event positions. We have two event positions. That's really a time-space statement. It's recapitulating the axiomatic basis of time-space, is that these are event positions. They're not just space positions. That We can measure that. But the event position looks like there's a separation when there's not. There's no event separation. This distance that we see as, as spatial distance is not a temporal separation. These two event these two events are one event. The, even though there are two positions, there's only one event. So this exists in another dimension. We're going to say it that way, although there's a better term for it. And so let me introduce that, reintroduce that term, which I've developed for my own sanity. Because dimension, dimensionality already has a, an application in linear geometry. Okay. <laughs> so we do have two separated events. But how are they separated? They're separated spatially. But other than that, there's no separation. So that's a direct contradiction to time space, correct? Now let's see what we can do with that to see how to solve the paradox. Because if there's no event separation, that means it's in another domain. It's not in the spatial domain. Avoiding the word dimension because of its linear nuance, which is accepted, so we don't want to conf confuse those two. So instead of saying dimension in two contexts, we're going to introduce a new word called domain, which I'm not the first one to do this. Domain, the time domain, is a concurrent term. And therefore, there are two domains, the space and time domain. Now, in relativity, they're locked together, space-time. But here we see that that's, it unbinds it. There is no such thing as space-time, which raises part of the paradox, because we know there is, right? There is such a thing as space-time. You cannot deny the value of space-time, but now you have to contextualize it. How do you know that space-time is true? What's the proof of space-time validity? Why are we warranted in treating Einstein's field equation as being an accurate representation of reality? How, how, do we, how do we justify that? It's going to be to a threshold because we're humans. Always remember that. But in physics, we're trying to transcend our human limitations, and we've been very successful at that as long as we've done science correctly. We want to continue to follow the tried and true method of science to make further progress, which is now we're at the edge, because we can't get past this, but we have to. We have to know the valid scope of relativity. So it's very important to reconsider how we know that space-time is true. Now it's easy to become defensive here. It's just an emotional reaction of a human, very natural, that if you are already committed to the fact, you think it's a fact, that space-time is absolute, there's no flaw in it, well then you're going to feel threatened by this. Einstein certainly did, which is really a remarkable thing to say about Einstein. I consider him to be in a class by himself, because when he objected to the quantum mechanical interpretation given by Bohr, which is there's no real interpretation that you're seeking, Albert, Albert stuck to his guns, but he was basically insisting against his own theory that there's something wrong with space-time. He's directly leading scientists to look at space-time. He himself did not find a flaw in his own space-time system. I think it's pretty normal for the discoverer. He might be biased, 
I think every discoverer has to be, for better or for worse, you have to convince yourself that you're right until you're proven wrong. Well, Einstein had no reason. Nobody thought relativity was wrong in any way. But let's take a look at that. How do we know that it's true? It's because it works in solar system space. We know that the ticking of clocks, including atomic clocks, is affected by relativistic influences. And here you'd almost have to say paradoxically, we know that relativistically. <laughs> it's um, very interesting to try to um, measure light because, and there's a Veritasium presentation on YouTube that explains this aspect of the space-time formulation, that in order to measure the speed of light, you can't measure it in one direction. You have to measure it on a bounce. You have to measure it on a reflection. Do you know why? It's because when you're measuring the speed of light in one direction, you cannot synchronize your clocks at both locations. And it can be shown that if you synchronize your clocks at position A, where you're going to fire the light ray, and then you separate the clocks in order to get this one where you're going to fire the ray, and now you think that the clocks are synchronized, they're not for the very reason that you separated the clocks. Now there's a time-space separation between the clocks, which means that they're not keeping the same time. Very interesting. You can overcome that by doing the same thing and separating the clocks and then just, you know, well, there is a fudge factor because now the clocks are not synchronized. If you send the light ray and it bounces back, you can compensate for the time differential on a subtraction. You could subtract out the time lag and then you get the actual distance covered on a reflection. So Veritasium is a presenter on YouTube. I recommend that video highly. But we think we've overcome that, and in fact we have, by using reflection experiments. Uh, Mickelson, Morley, and many others since have measured the speed of light quite accurately, and it's a fixed constant rate. And it is a ratio, it's a proportional number. It's the proportionality between time and space, that is between distance and time lag. So that's pretty simple, but it doesn't, doesn't apply at the quantum level. And, and so the unification that's being sought is to explain the quantum phenomenon so that it doesn't violate relativity. Well, in order to do that, we've just discovered just now, you and I, you need to look at relativity because that is almost certainly the source of the error is that you misformulated relativity. Well, that, that's quite challenging. Nobody wants to hear that because that is, that's a seismic, <laughs> the bedrock is cracking now. Not so, and scientists should never react that way. We are human, and we do have vested interests in this world and our jobs, etc. Our reputation, our sanity, really, you know, you can't fault a human for defending a known true model, because that's the whole purpose of science. But here we found a flaw. And the flaw is not in the universe. We've discovered something in the universe that's a flaw from our perspective, but now we have to find out where the flaw is. You're not going to find it in the universe. You're going to find it in your systematic approach because the universe does not ever contradict itself in any way. That's the basis of science, so you have to accept that rational approach. That can be proved, by the way. It has been proved. So this is a, a valid challenge to relativity. I mean, if I were in the industry, I know that the hairs on my arms would be standing up, the hackles on my neck would be coming up like a rooster, you know, getting ready for a cockfight. Like, oh, I don't go there. That's relativity. That's space time. <laughs> well, there is, science has to be courageous and honest and explore all avenues because you always find something in the last place you look. Have you ever heard that riddle? H how come you always 
How come whenever you find something, it's always in the last place you look? It takes a moment to realize the logical answer is because once you've found it, you stop looking. No. Oh. <laughs> what, what if what you found turns out to be not what you were looking for and you just thought it was what you were looking for, wa wandered off with it and played with it, whatever you're doing, with what you were looking for that you needed and you look at it and it's not what you wanted at all. Well, that's what's happening. So look at it that way, just in a humorous sort of a lighthearted approach to the foundation of physics. <laughs> Let's just play around with the foundation of reality as we know it and see if we made a mistake. Well, of course, <laughs> there might be some people who are a little worried about that approach. Because what, what if you do find a flaw in relativity? Well, ask yourself that question as I just check my stupid phone. Oh, God. Sorry about that. <laughs> so what would be that flaw in relativity? Well, on, on spatial separation, you can say in certain contexts, which we fully explored, that when there's a spatial separation, there's an event separation. That's common sense. And, yeah, well, if it's common sense, you just pass right over it. Well, there's nothing to look at there. Well, the quantum entanglement phenomenon proves that you're wrong. And here's where you're wrong when you say, well, that's relativity, so this cannot be happening. Well, the reason it's happening is because relativity is wrong. Well, well now you need to ask, if you're brave, courageous, and lighthearted... Just take this, uh, just have a beer and, and figure it out together. Let's hear your crackpot. <laughs> so you, it should not be adversarial, but, well, it's logically adversarial. We're trying to get real, true answers. So the violation is this. Is that when you have two coordinated particles, they don't give a damn about relativity. So how can you state that so it makes any sense at all? There's no event separation. And, and that's the answer to a threshold, if it can be proved. Well, you must say now with us, you and I, science has done this, there is no event separation. So now you have to question relativity. What went wrong with the relativistic formulation? You have to ask this question, well, where in the world do you begin digging into Einstein's field equation to figure out what he did wrong? Well, I did that, and it took me over a year of intensive research, ending about a year ago when I began the second half of my broadcast series, because this is a discovery vector. I wasn't looking for the solution to the quantum paradox. I was showing a new geometry two years ago, but then I did what scientists do and attempted to show its value by seeing if spherical geometry could be applied to the quantum paradox, apply it to the edge and see if we can make new predictions that science could not predict before. In this case, it's the prediction of structure, that there's an explanation that's geometric and, and, and physically sound. Well, that would be the solution then if we can get that geometric formulation. That's what I discovered, and here's how you can see it. When you have the two coordinated particles, you can say that they're just one particle. Because even though we can see that there's a spatial separation, they don't see it. They These two separate positions, this is a these are two separated events and two separated positions. You have to say both. But when they're coordinated, you can make them spatially separated but with no event separation. And so they're virtually one particle in two positions. Actually, you could say it slightly better and you really do have to say it both ways. They're two event potentials. As they're sitting there, they're not events because nothing is happening. So they're 
they continue to stay coordinated at any distance. Well, no matter what distance, and this has been exaggerated to opposite ends of the universe, well, a moment's thought will convince you that that's the same thing as the twins paradox, Gedanken experiment. It's ridiculous. You're not going to separate them to two ends of the solar system or two ends of the earth because the quantum entangled state is delicate. These two things must not be disturbed at all. Not even by a photon. Which raises another question is how could you even set up this how could you maintain the state, the coordinated event state, where these two things behave as if they're one particle? How far away can you drag them? I'll give you the plain, simple, honest answer. You can't drag them very far away from each other. The way to set up these experiments is absolutely mesmerizingly complex. And don't think that these scientists doing these experiments are unaware. They, they go to extraordinary measures to cover their tracks to make sure they're not overlooking anything because they're attempting to prove, as we are phrasing it, they're attempting to prove whether or not relativity holds in the universe for all phenomena. Well, for two coordinated particles, behaving as one event state they're separated by space, but they're the same event state. So when one changes, of course the other one changes because they're not separate. Well, that's spooky action at a distance in another context. And it can be shown, strongly shown, virtually proved, <laughs> so far you'd have to continue to say almost proved, we could say that it's proved, but only hypothetically, because there's a margin of error. We're not absolutely sure of this for any experiment, but we do. But we can narrow it down. We're very clever creatures, and we've learned how to use our technology, and I believe that this has been demonstrated. I don't know why men would, or, you know, science would continue to pursue this. Like, this like the Hadron Colliders. Well, that seems like a mighty expense to get a little tiny phenomenon. Yeah, but there's reasons why we want that, that little tiny phenomenon to be understood because we can get massive results from it, pardon the pun. So we have two spatially separated coordinated event positions. These are event positions in space-time. But they act as one event even though they're two positions. So that's another way to say it, and I hope you're starting to see that this has a geometric implication that the geometric spatial separation is not coordinated with a, with a temporal separation, which violates Einstein's law, which says that for every spatial separation, there is an equal and proportional, there's a proportional time separation. Or correct, yeah, that's true. So now there's not. So, <laughs> so now we have space as a separate domain from time. And that's what we need to get at. And I believe now, having thought about this over several nights, as I continue to probe this, I'm not stopping, though. I'm going on. <laughs> but, you know, I pause to give you what I know because that's what science does. You share it, first of all, because you get feedback. Otherwise, it's not science, right? It's communicative or it's not science. So that's why I do this, but also for personal reasons, because science has a feedback system that benefits the explorer, the potential discoverer, as I'm attempting to be. I believe I am a discoverer. So let's, let's home in on my discovery that explains event coordination over spatial separation. You can state that equivalently using the two words entangled and superposition as I taught you yesterday but let me restate that because I it actually sounded pretty cool to me too <laughs> you have you have you have spatial separation of position with a coordinated event state which we call entanglement that's the coordinated event state is called entanglement. And so you have 
coordinated event state over superposition. As you separate, these are superpositions. Superpositions. And you can think of superposition now in terms of entanglement. That you're superposing. This is superposition. As you're drawing them away from each other, you're superposing them. Here, they're, they're coordinated when they're in proximity. And so they're not... You could say they're superposed, but who cares? They're right next to each other, so they know each other right then and there. But now when you separate them, you're superposing them. That they're, you're making a, a spatial separation. Well, that's superposition. And what you're superposing is an entangled state. So you're superposing coordinated event positions. You're superposing coordinated event positions. And the meaning behind that that creates the paradox is that as you're superposing the coordinated event position, as you're superposing the coordinated event position, there is no time separation. When you do this, when you superpose the two events, so that they're in two different positions. There's no difference in time. The time lag directly implied by space-time formulation does no longer exist. It doesn't, it's not there. So the superposition of entanglement violates the space-time formulation. How does it do that? you can begin to visualize that by realizing what you're doing linearly. That in all of these doing this, you're seeing a straight line, aren't you? Here's what's actually happening. As you superpose, you're forced to a linear interpretation of spatial separation. We take that for granted, no foul there. But as you say that, when you introduce Einsteinian relativity to this simple separation of position, you are making two simultaneous separations, one in space and in one in time. What Einstein discovered is that those are coordinated. What we discovered from quantum mechanics is they're not coordinated. So they're both coordinated and not coordinated. Where is the coordination and where is the non-coordination? Look again at your linear separation. This is a linear separation of spatial position to separate the particles is on a straight line. What about the time separation? Using Einsteinian relativity, we have linearized the concept of time. That's what Einstein did. He linearized time. But now we find in the quantum paradox situation of entanglement that this separation of space as we, to the proportion that we perceive that as a linear separation in space, the separation in time is nonlinear. That's the correct geometric framework for observing the paradoxical situation. That Einsteinian space-time says that this is a linear separation of events when experimentation proves that it's not a linear separation of events. Then what is it? What We're seeing a separation and we associate the event state with the position. 
But even though the position is changing on a line so that there's increasing spatial separation, there's no change in the event state. And in order to prove that, you have to make a measurement to check the event, which then you're trying to show whether or not it, it, it changes the other state without regard to the spatial separation, which means then that they're simultaneous, that there's no time separation associated with the spatial separation. That's very easy to say. And now you're beginning to see it geometrically if you look at it this way, that as the spatial separation is created on a line, that dimension of the line is unrelated to event space. And you have to say space, but it's a geometric space. It's the geometric space of events where even though there's a spatial separation, there's no associated event separation, which is virtually the definition of an alternate dimension. I've discovered the location of that dimension so that you can see it. Okay, uh, let's keep going. It can be proved geometrically and mathematically, and I have proved it, I proved this in 2022, that as you create a 1D linear space, we simple definition of a line is a 1D space. It's a spatial concept of one dimensionality. And now you're using that one dimensionality of linear space Hold that in mind. This is all happening on a line in space, which is redundant. But the events are not separating. They're not separating on that line. But they are separating, but not on that line. And you can't measure the separation on that line because it's not occurring on that line. So as the two particles are being separated, is generally done, I believe, with an electromagnetic field, but however these particles are separated, their positions must remain known, and this has been done. And so we, you get a fixed distance between them, and then you try to measure the simultaneity. Very difficult to do, but it has been done, we think, and I believe so. It has been done. So now might be the right time to just introduce into your mind a new possible geometry just to try out to see if the skirt fits your waist you know, let's try this out so as the particles are being separated spatially there's no there's no equivalent linear separation of events that this is now a pure space line whereas the events remain coordinated in event space that's the overlay of space space. You have spatial space and temporal space. If you're willing to go out on that limb, let's keep going. As this separates on a line, the two coordinated events are being seemingly separated since in space, then in time, but they're not being separated in time. What if you can't see the actual separation being made. That would be in an orthogonal universe. We use the word universe here, and I believe that that's a mistake, but I'm just saying it the way it's been done in the many worlds theorem, is you're trying to split the whole universe. Well, really, you need to take that with, you need to reinterpret that, because nobody really means the universe splits. It means that local space is behaving as if it were a different, in a different dimensional shape. Well, that's exactly right. Because as the spatial separation is made, the time separation is perpendicular. 
and you can't see it because it's an imaginary space. And we know about this mathematically, linearly. We know about complex space. And so this is actually the complex dimension, which is complex space. This is a well-known construction of 2D space. So this is the 2D projection of what's actually happening is that we can measure the spatial separation and the event separation is occurring orthogonally such that we can't see it because it's non-spatial. That is the definition of orthogonality in the relationship between space and time. And Einstein proved the orthogonal relationship does exist. It's the basis of the EFE, is orthogonality. Because when you have cubic space, as Einstein used, when you add a fourth orthogonal axis, it's an imaginary space. It has to be because it can't be spatial. Well, that's why it's called time. So time is orthogonal to cubic space. What we're seeing here is, is that time is orthogonal to space. But to say now that it's cubic actually makes no sense. We think of orthogonality in terms of linearity. So you can see this if you picture it on a... Your eye, your eye level is on a plane, so you only see the line, but it's actually a plane. Well, if you get above it and look down on it, you see the line just as you did before, but now you can see time going orthogonally out proportionally with space on a right angle. And if you're at eye level with that right angle, you can't see the right angle because this one dimensionality, as you look down the barrel of time, it's zero in linear space. But it's not zero in, in real space. It's not, it's not zero in physical space. I proved that in 2022. Instead, you are seeing a right angle, but not a linear right angle. It's the same right angle with a footnote, but seen in spherical space. Where now, the perpendicularity that I discovered that explains this relationship between space and time you do need linearity somewhere in the spherical system. I located it, so let's just be sure we understand spherical linearity can only be composed on a force line. And we know that from gravity, but we also know it from light propagation, and that's inherent in my discovery, this major insights all the way through physics. So in a spheric space, the line that we think of as a straight line, like the force line of gravity from when you stand up in, from your chair, you make, you make yourself stand up around a force line that's perpendicular to the surface of the Earth. Technically, the force line that holds your feet to the ground and you have a mechanism in your ear that you can maintain balance, but you're standing on a line that's perpendicular to the plane of gravity. And here, this is an extension of the word plane because it's a spherical plane. Because the surface of a sphere is a closed line. And in spherical space, that closed line is the surface of the sphere. Because it doesn't go off to infinity, it closes. And we call that a sphere in volume space. Well, the single line coming out from that, you can think of it as coming out, but for gravity it's going in. But it's the same line. It's all the lines are equivalent. So that's the integral line. So in spheric space, there is a straight line, but it's the integral of all the lines. So if you can wrap your mind around that, and I sincerely hope you can, because it's obvious that you can say this, that there's one line... Although it's not, it's not an open line, because an open line goes to two infinities. 
but it can be proved that that line is actually going to one infinity. Because when you draw a straight line, you're drawing a sphere at the same time. When you draw a straight line and you separate the two polar edges of the circle, we could picture this as a circle, but it's the same as for a sphere. When you pull on a line, it goes in two opposite directions. But when you pull on that same point spherically, it simply goes out. And that's a force line. Going out, it's called centrifugal force. So this does get deep pretty quick, but this is pure geometry. There's nothing unknown about this. But nobody really talks about this, so this is new. That this is a single integral line, either going out or in. In other words, it has a direction. It's either going in toward the center, or it's going out toward the edge in the spherical construction. Well, you can see that if you're pulling on the two edges of the circle, you're making a straight line as you do so. So you pull out the two edges of the circle and it forms the circle. The circle gets bigger as you stretch that line. There's a fixed relationship between that circle and that line. And therefore, as I've proved, although it was already known, I proved it in a new way. As you stretch that to make the circle, in volume space you're stretching out a sphere. So it begins at the point, as we say, that would be the center of gravity. And you pull it out. That makes the sphere of gravity. Because gravity is absolutely spherical around a center of gravity. That's well known. Now look at your entangled particles. And you have them at a point, because you can have the, the center that's between them be a point. And they're so close that you can coordinate them, generally done electromagnetically. So they're now in a coordinated state. And now you pull the line. Well, as you're pulling that line, you're pulling out a sphere. Correct? Yes. But that sphere is closed. The line is opening in two directions. You're separating in space. That creates a line in space with linear spatial separation. But as you're pulling the two particles apart, you're also manifesting a closed line called a sphere. And that sphere is perpendicular to the radial line. As you pull the line, for two particles, these are points. And so you're separating them linearly, since that's the only way we know of to separate things spatially. It makes perfect sense, and nobody has ever questioned that, so we continue to say that. Well, I'm, I want to state up front, I don't see any objection to that. What I do see, in addition to the linear separation of the two event states, the event states remain coordinated. That's on the sphere. That as you're separating them, you cannot see the sphere that's coordinating them, not through space. So you're making a time sphere as you create linear separation between the two coordinated particles. They remain coordinated on their spherical surface that they share, and it's bigger than the line, and that just baffles us. Because if it's bigger than the line, wouldn't that be a longer distance? It's not distance. They're coordinated in another dimension. It's the dimension of the surface of that sphere. You can't see it because it's not in space. It's in time. So as the, you're separating the two particles in space, they remain coordinated on the sphere. And that perfectly explains the collapse of the wave function. Essentially, what's happening in the propagation of light, which is what we're trying to get to, the collapse of the wave function, when the photon is pulled out, it's pulled out spherically. It has a linear component. It has a linear distance from its source. But as the photon is being separated from its source in space, it's not being separated from its source in time. That doesn't make sense. 
we know that there's a separation in time as that propagates in space. So that's not quite correct, but we're getting close. So look at it another way. As the photon, which is a particle, <laughs> heads out on its straight line, which can be measured at the terminus to be a straight line. And when it arrives after its straight line trajectory to its objective from a distant star to Earth, where it's recomposed into a particle, it leaves as a, as a particle, but then there's a linear separation between the photon and its source. You're separating the two entangled states. This is a different kind of entanglement, though. So, when the photon arrives, it reconstitutes itself from its existential position on the wave, which is a spherical wavefront. It simply is there in time, which means that the photon superposes itself to the surface of its spherical wavefront, and that is superposition, that the photon is everywhere on the surface of that sphere. Spatially, it's not. Spatially, it's separating itself from its source. That can be measured. That's called, we measure it in light years. It's separating itself from its source in space, but it's not separating itself from itself on the sphere. It's everywhere on the sphere at the same time. At the same time, it's on the surface of its spherical wavefront. That means that the photon, as a particle, is superposed on the surface of the sphere, which means it's in the same event state everywhere on the sphere. So when it's, re when it's measured, when it arrives, that's essentially its measurable state. It looks like it instantaneously collapses to a particle. You could state that differently so that it would make a little bit more sense. You could say that the superposed particle in temporal space, it's superposed so that it's everywhere at once, temporally. It's everywhere on that sphere. The, the photon is literally all the photons it could possibly be. That's the essence of superposition. But when it's recovered at its destination, the capture of the photon on a photographic plate or in the retina of your eye, however that works, we're getting there too. However it's reconstituted from its temporal state, it loses no information. That is amazing that that superposed particle, which is everywhere at once on its spherical surface, in time it's everywhere, linearly it's changing position in space, but it does not change position with respect to itself in time. It's a coordinated spherical surface that when it arrives had never changed. Its temporal orientation to itself never changes. Its spatial orientation changes with respect to its source. So there's a linear separation in distance, in space. But in time, nothing happens to the photon in time. It remains on that sphere the whole time. In all positions, it is the wave. And so when it's recovered, that makes sense now, because it's not changing in time. So when you capture it, you capture it, any position that you capture it in on the sphere, it's the same. It's the same particle, it never changed, it was always everywhere. And so when it arrives, it, it hadn't changed in time. It did change linearly in space though, and that causes redshift. We could say it that way, but we could also say it the other way. It's somehow different when it's in its spherical condition, even though it's just the particle doing something that, we, that baffles us. It doesn't baffle itself, it's perfectly fine. 
being what it is in all positions at once, such that when it arrives it hasn't changed, except on some differential and that causes the redshift. Something makes it lose energy on the way. Well, we do need to know what that is, but that is, do, does not violate any intuition. Fritz Vicky called it tired light because he couldn't figure it out, but he knew he had to give it a name. I think that's very difficult to perceive, don't you? Because you have to endure several attempted violations of your reason in order to even see that, well, it does make sense geometrically. So to restate what we just saw, the temporal domain has a spherical relationship to space. It's not just orthogonal, it's also spherical. That's the nature of the illusion, that the sphere that's expanding, we think of as expanding in space and time, which should cause pure dissipation. It should have no ability to retain its information, but it does retain all of its information. It's retaining it in time. Because everything that that photon is, it remains in time, not in space. It's traveling through space, but it's not traveling through time with respect to itself. That the spatial separation that we imagine on the sphere is illusory. There is no spatial separation on the sphere. And that can be proved geometrically on a force balance relationship that was discovered by Rudyard Yosef Boschkovich, that you're looking at a spherical right angle. And it's absolutely perplexing to us because we consistently interpret it as a linear right angle. Well, that induces a zero, which messes things up. You don't want to have that zero at the orthogonality. That's how we compose linear space, so we seem to be stuck with it. That's the error. That is the error, because you're not seeing spherical space correctly because it doesn't start from a zero center. Anywhere in the universe that zero does not exist. When the photon leaves its origin, that's not zero. It's leaving from a surface, a perfectly spherical surface called an electronic shell. Now I meant to get back to a certain paradox that's a footnote to this that's quite irritating. This was pointed out to me by a very astute commentator and I'm very grateful for this remark. When I stated some months ago, not hastily, but knowing that I had to say something while not saying something else, I stated inaccurately that light only comes from electrons. Well, not quite true. It also comes from protons if they're violently disturbed. If a, if a proton is cracked in a certain way, it will emit light in the form of gamma rays. It's very high frequency because it's a very tiny thing. Well, it's an extremely tiny thing. What's causing the light to come out of a proton, which does not have the right shape to produce a photon, only an electron seeming, seemingly can produce a photon because they're both energy states. Whereas the proton does not appear to be an energy state, although we know it is, we're not quite sure how to state how it manifests energy. It manifests a force for space contraction. That's what a proton does. It contracts space. Certainly for electrons it does. So that's known. But that's still not energy. No, it's not. It's a different form of energy. You could say that because it... It is energy, but this is part of the paradox that affects the proton as well. Then why would a proton emit energy when it does not have an energy state? It has a force state. Well, what you need to know about that force then? Well, we've probed that, and here's what we discovered about the proton as a space point. It manifests a force field that's spherical, and we discovered that there are two forces involved. There's a centrifugal force that keeps the electron from getting in. That's the definition of centrifugal force. It's keeping the electron out. But outside that bound, 
it's exerting an attractive force on the electron. So the electron is drawn towards the protonic shell and then it, it executes a spherical right angle, which has always remained baffling to us. I probed that and got the geometric solution and it was confirmed 250 years ago by Ruger Yosef Boschkovich. So I'm definitely right. Definitely right. To prove that, so that you could prove it to someone else as well, you need to examine the proton to see the two forces, centrifugal going out to the shell, and beyond it, centripetal. So picture the shell around the proton, and on the outside is a vector field that goes in. But when it reaches that spherical limit, it shifts to a vector field going out. These are the two definitions that we need for force balance. And that perfectly describes the construction of the atom. Have we perfectly described the construction of the proton as two forces so far? But what generates the centrifugal force? It can be shown that the centrifugal force has to come, first of all, from the center, because the center is what's exerting the force. Well, that center has to be doing something to generate a centrifugal force. That is the same centrifugal force that's inherently manifest in both the electron and the proton. The centrifugal force of the electron is contained by a centripetal force that holds it spherically to locality and when when that and so the centrifugal force is exerting a pressure outward that's what centrifugal force is and that's what energy is on the surface of the sphere you're starting to see the connection now this motion is a repeating motion on a closed line nothing to do with space we to see it spatially we see it as the equator of a circle of rotation of a sphere. And so this repeating motion is energy. It's not space. This is energy. This is energy. It has to be moving to manifest its dimension. Its dimension is the surface of the sphere. Therefore, the surface of this sphere is non-spatial. It's the non-spatial dimension that we call time. But I want to show you a secret of the universe that's going to help you forever. This is not happening in space when you see it right. Okay? You say that it's happening in space, but notice there's something that's non-spatial. What is it? It's this. Listen. Click. 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 That's time. That's the linearization of the angular momentum is our perception of time. Click, click. That's the separation of events. Click, click, click. That's called frequency. Click, click, click. The speed of that frequency is angular momentum. It's directly related. These are geometrically related, but only on the surface of a sphere, which is a closed line. In order to induce this, click, click, click. You can't induce that on a line. It just goes boo, off to infinity. This does not go off to infinity. This repeats in a closed locality. That therefore is not spatial because it's not extensive. It goes around in a circle. What goes around in a circle? A force goes around in a circle called centrifugal force. That's one way to say it. But the, the take-home, the takeaway, is that is, that is not happening in extensible space. It's happening in another dimension that's at right angles to space. And here's how you see it. See it. The force line, either going out for centrifugal or in for centripetal, is perpendicular to that spherical surface. And that is exactly how space is perpendicular to time. Albert missed it. I got it. So I hope that helps you. We'll have a lot more. This is just beginning. This is the beginning of a new sequence of discoveries, which I've already pioneered, but 
you know, this needs to be carried on because anybody who goes this way is going to get all the solutions. That'll be in the next presentation. Thank you for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed this. And that's 100 minutes. All right. Early March here in Chico. Keep looking up when the skies part at night. Be sure you take a gander. And no matter how chilly you get, don't get hypothermia. Be sure you always carry a coat in your car so that when you want to look at the night sky, you can pull off the freeway and spend five minutes and have a... And this is Anagalactic. We'll be right back.